My name is Phil Marshall. Um, I uh, was a dust-off pilot in Vietnam. Dust-off was the radio call sign from the medevac helicopters. Uh, I'm originally from the Dayton area, still live in the Dayton area, uh, always have. But uh, I, first of all, I want to thank you for being here. Because it wasn't that many years ago that if you knew there was going to be a Vietnam veteran talking, you'd find anything else to do. I mean, you know, give the cat a bath or something. Just you, you, There's just no way you're going to waste your time going. Um, so anyway, you know, I used to give my cat a bath, but the hair kept sticking to my tongue, so I had to quit doing it. <laughs> so that, that was where, where that came from. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I know we got some Vietnam veterans here. How many, please? I know this gentleman is. Three, four. Welcome home, gentlemen. Um, so uh, a lot of what you're going to see uh, is going to be old hat for them. But uh, uh, more importantly to me, uh, don't hesitate to interrupt. If I, if I don't make sense or you don't understand what I said or something's not clear uh, or you got a question about anything about the presentation, please uh, don't hesitate to ask. Haven't missed a thing, sir. Make that four Vietnam veterans here today. Um, the reason I joined the Army in 68, I was 19 years old and military draft eligible. Uh, I went to Ohio State right out of high school, was no more ready than the man on the moon. Um, more interested in where the parties were and not enough uh, interested in where the library was. So uh, at that time, if you were not a four-year full-time student, if you weren't married with at least one child, you were draft eligible. I had no desire to go to Canada, so I decided I'm going to enlist for something worthwhile. And uh, when the Army told me that I was qualified for flight school, um, you know, where do I sign and when can I leave? Have a seat, sir. Thank you. I flew for the 237th Medical Detachment. HA was helicopter ambulance. That's a Huey helicopter built by Bell uh, Helicopters in Fort Worth. Uh, this picture is very unique. Uh, I actually flew that helicopter. Uh, of course, you notice that my pen is not working. I just put fresh batteries in it. There we go. Oh, okay. That's not showing up on the screen. Wonderful. Okay. Um, down in the left-hand corner, you see a guy with a flight helmet on. You see the, the, the infantry helmets, but, but the guy with the flight helmet on is our medic. Our medics didn't get out of the aircraft like that unless they absolutely had to. They're just hovering there. They're not sitting on the ground. Um, and so my crew chief, our crew chief, is helping get the litter into the aircraft with that wounded guy. The reason the medic is over here, he had to get out right away. Their medic is the one that's injured, and he's popping an IV. The guys on the ground couldn't get the IV in. So uh, the photographer with this unit is the one that took the picture, and they got it to us uh, a couple of weeks later. But uh, we know all four of our crew members in the aircraft. And in fact, the uh, co-pilot in the right seat, which is where the co-pilot never normally sat in a Huey, he actually had to get out of the seat, climb over the console, and help the crew chief get that litter in. So we know, know a lot about this picture, but it's just kind of uh, symbolic or, or uh, typical of, of what, we, what we flew and what we did. Uh, map of the U.S., <laughs> we're here, and we are right there. Okay, uh, A little closer, we're still there. Uh, 237th DMZ dust off was what we called ourselves. We were the northernmost dust off unit in Vietnam. Uh, the map uh, is South Vietnam, and the country is about the same size as the state of Washington. Not very big. One of the aircraft that we used uh, was what we called the LOCH. L O H is Light Observation Helicopter. That was built by Hughes Aircraft. And this one's unusual because it has the red crosses on it. The Loach was designed uh, to go out and look for the bad guys. It was a scout helicopter. And they decided that, well, gosh, this thing's so small, maybe it can get into some small LZs that we can't, landing zones, that we can't get into with our Huey. So they put red crosses on it. They came up with one. Who knows how they got it. But uh, that lasted about two months. They crashed, and both pilots were killed. So they didn't do that anymore. Come on in. You haven't missed much at all. Uh, another one of the aircraft that we use, uh, I forgot to point it out, that's called the Cayuse, named after an Indian tribe. The Chinook, uh, dual engine, dual rotor, very, very versatile, still made today, brand new helicopter. Of course, Chinook is an Indian tribe, and uh, as you can see, even though the aircraft that is being uh, towed, so to speak, is uh, stripped down, no rotors or no engines, it, it can just about carry its own weight again. 
Then we also had the Tarhe, the Sky Crane, uh, that had seven rotor blades, two very powerful engines, uh, could lift 10 tons. Uh, very, very, I'm sorry, 10,000 pounds, not 10 tons. Um, this aircraft is no longer used by the Army. Those that uh, were left uh, all are in commercial use now. Uh, the unique thing about this one is, um, I don't want to crawl over my cords, there is a plexiglass bubble on the back of the fuselage looking backwards. There's three pilots that fly that aircraft, two in the front, and the one in the back sits backwards. Because the two pilots can't see that lift, uh, he flies the aircraft backwards. He has full controls, so he's flying the aircraft whenever they pick up a sling load. So that was kind of an unusual aircraft. And then uh, we, have, we have the Sioux, an Indian tribe. Those of you that remember MASH, that was the MASH helicopter. Now the reason I featured this aircraft for you, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you can see the pods on the outside of the helicopter. Those were for the wounded. Now, that helicopter, it was all it could do to pick up the, the two wounded and the pilot. That was all the power it had. Um, but the Army realized the value of an aeromedical evacuation helicopter. What they don't point out to you in the movie or the television series of MASH is <clears throat> this aircraft did not pick up the wounded in battle. The wounded would be taken to a forward aid station, they would stabilize the wounded, and then the MASH helicopter would take them back to the hospital where they could get much more needed surgery. But again, the Army realized the value of that aircraft. So what they did was they put out a contract and they said, we want an aircraft with a turbine engine, an enclosed cabin, it's got to have a crew chief and a medic, and we got to be able to pick up more than one or two wounded. Well, what we came up with, what the Army came up with in Bell Helicopter was the Huey, an absolutely amazing, amazing aircraft. Um, just, it was the B-17 of the Vietnam War. Uh, it just did everything very, very well. Uh, you notice the guys are sitting on the floor with their feet hanging out. Uh, that was typical. And why did you do that? Well, you wanted out of that sucker. Yeah. As soon, <laughs> soon as you got close to the ground, you wanted out. I would be sitting on my flap jacket and my helmet. Yep. So that's a that's a rather typical picture there. Um, the, uh, as I've got there in the narrative, uh, did anybody know how the Huey got its name? Okay. Very simply. It was originally a helicopter utility one. HU-1 looks like HUI Huey, okay? Huey is not an Indian tribe, okay? So, uh, anybody know what's the Native American name for a Huey? Anybody? Gosh, you got, what, four or five Vietnam veterans here? That. Iroquois, Iroquois, okay? So, uh, they're... Um, I, I did a lot of checking. I found that there's an unverified translation of the word Huey from Native Americans. Dances with bullets. You yeah. Vietnam vets will appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, just teasing there a little bit. Okay. However, there is one Army helicopter not named after an Indian tribe. And you Vietnam vets, if you don't answer it, you're going to kick yourselves in the butt when I tell you. Cobra. Cobra. Very good. Very good. It's amazing how many Vietnam vets... I don't know. Okay, so why doesn't the Cobra have an Indian name? Snake? Yeah, there's no snake tribe. Well, Bell Helicopter um, decided that they were going to build a gunship. The Army didn't ask for one, but they said, gee, we'll take the tail boom off of a Huey, the engine, transmission, flight controls, all that, and we're going to put it in a three foot wide fuselage to make a much smaller target and they hung all kinds of guns on it and stuff. They developed it from a piece of paper to a flying aircraft in two years. And so because they used so many components off of the Huey, it was called a Huey Cobra. Now Bell Aircraft built the Aero Cobra in World War II, a fighter which mostly went to Russia. So in recognition of their Aero Cobra, they called it the, uh, the uh, oh gosh, Heli Cobra. Army didn't like that, they said it's a Huey Cobra. Well now we just call it a Cobra. So technically, I guess you could say it's also an Iroquois, okay? So I said uh, we were dust off. That was our radio call sign for our medevac helicopters. The call sign came purely from chance, but even today they use the term dust off. Uh, in Vietnam, all of the dust off helicopters used the same radio frequency. Anytime you guys got in trouble, there was one radio frequency you could go to. 
you'd either get an aircraft in the air or you would get a base and we'd be there as soon as we could. Uh, and I'll talk about it a little bit more here in a minute. But uh, we had an alternate frequency because we knew the bad guys were, were listening in. And I, I'll touch on that a little bit more too. But uh, very early in the war, uh, powers that be called all the helicopter units in and said, okay guys, here's a list of acceptable call signs for your unit. And the, uh, the executive officer that, that uh, was representing the uh, dust off uh, medevac uh, unit at that time, saw the word dust off and said, well, that kind of describes what we're doing, picking up our wounded. So uh, six months later, when they decided to try to fool the enemy and change all the call signs around, they said, no, we're not, we're not changing dust off. Everybody knows we're keeping it that. We're not going to try to fool anybody. Uh, it's just like when uh, our guys would get in trouble. Give me your coordinates in the, in the clear. Don't give me this coded stuff. The bad guys know where you're at. I want to know where you're at, okay? So don't, don't give me, uh, you know, just, we'll just go that way. Now, even though we had a Red Cross on the aircraft, uh, Geneva Convention said that we did not carry any offensive weapons, which we did not. Uh, we did not supply our troops with ammunition, although occasionally a six-pack of beer might fall off the aircraft when we went in, uh, cold Cokes or something like that. But we did abide by the Geneva Convention. We picked up uh, wounded POWs. But uh, the bad guys still like to make things difficult for us. Uh, that's a hard landing. The, the, the skids are spread. The uh, tail boom has been a hard landing. The tail boom has broken off. The transmission went forward. Rotor blades are off. So uh, now this one's already been recovered. But uh, uh, it could be hazardous duty at times. Excuse me. Um, here's another example. Uh, this one, the rotor blades have completely separated. Tail boom's been completely chopped off. I would guess that they've gone into a village. We did pick up civilians, uh, picked up a, a pregnant Vietnamese woman who was having a difficult pregnancy, picked up a, a child once that uh, had, uh, I, I don't remember what the, the problem was, but we picked up civilians and uh, even picked up a guard dog one night. But that was our job. That was, that was what we were there for. But um, the problem was, the bad guys got a $500 bonus for taking down any one of our helicopters. Didn't make any difference if they had a Red Cross on it or not. And they also, uh, we found out later, that they received a medal for shooting us down. So uh, they had the incentive to do it. I don't know what good $500 would do in the jungle, but maybe they sent it home to mom and dad in North Vietnam. Who knows? Um, we, uh, when I was talking about uh, some of the civilian uh, rescues that we did, uh, one, uh, I was not there at the time. This was after I had left. Um, one, uh, uh, one night they received a call for a Vietnamese baby who had pulled a pot of boiling water over on himself. Had third degree burns, second, third degree burns, pretty much all over his body. Bad weather at night and they went out to pick up this baby and, uh, and its mother. Well, they had an instrument uh, malfunction. Uh, are any of you pilots? <coughs> You have instruments that help you to keep the aircraft in the air in bad weather at night and so on. Well, they had a failure and they crashed. And uh, um, the medic on this aircraft was killed. Uh, as medevac helicopters, we had an onboard medic, we had a crew chief, which is like a riding mechanic, and then two pilots. Um, the, you can see the right part of the cockpit is pretty well wiped out there. Uh, that pilot got lucky, he uh, flew again, the pilot that's on the ground side, uh, he broke his back and never flew again. Um, unfortunately, uh, when this aircraft was lost, nobody heard from them. And of course, bad weather at night, everybody assumed the worst. So two aircraft went out to look for them. Well, one of the aircraft uh, commanders got out there and said, hey, this, this is too bad. We're going to have to look for them at light. At light. So this is, this is just nuts to be out here in this. The other guy says, hey, that's my roommate. I'm going to look for him. Well, unfortunately, what happened was they crashed and all four were killed. So when I hear people call Vietnam veteran baby killers, I'm not saying that civilians were never killed, it's war, but uh, we lost two perfectly good aircraft and five men trying to save the life of a Vietnamese baby. So if you ever hear that term again, please remember that uh, uh, our, our cause was noble. So, um, the VHPA is the Vietnam Helicopter Pilots Association. Um, best we can figure, the Army, all, all, for, all forces in, in Vietnam, uh, trained about 40,000 uh, helicopter pilots. Uh, 
So there's the numbers you can see. Uh, almost half the helicopters that were sent to Vietnam were destroyed. Uh, about half of that, over half of that were, were Hueys. But that was a workhorse. It did everything. It did everything very well. Um, it could take one round and be shot down. It could take over 100 rounds and not be shot down. Uh, it was just, like I say, it was the B-17 of the Vietnam War. Um, the uh, 5,000 helicopters at any one time in Vietnam, most at Hueys, we had about 110 medevac helicopters in Vietnam at any one time. Uh, but the, the bad news is we were completely unarmed, and the, black, and the bad guys knew that. And so we were vulnerable. Uh, they weren't stupid. They, uh, when they saw the Red Cross, they knew we were going in to pick up wounded. They would let us get more souls on board and then shoot at us when we came out. So, uh, like I say, they weren't, they weren't stupid. 40% uh, of our missions were flown at night. Most aircraft did not fly very much at night. We did. Uh, guys get in a firefight at night, they got wounded, we're, we're going to go get them. Uh, and how we landed that aircraft in the middle of complete, utter darkness at night to a flashlight yeah. or a strobe light that's dropped down the barrel of a grenade launcher and pointed up at us, uh, it's just, I, I, I shudder to think about it and how we got away with it. Uh, because uh, no electricity, you get a couple miles away from the, from the coast, there's no electricity there, and at night, it's, it's dark, dark, dark. Uh, we had a ter term for it, which I can't repeat right now, but uh, it was dark. Um, aircraft and crews, we were disposable. Um, the Army was training, when I went through the program in 68 and 69, uh, about 250 warrant officer candidates every two weeks. My rank is warrant officer. Uh, about 150 officer students, lieutenants, captains, majors, uh, we called them RLOs, real live officers. We were warrant officers. We weren't real live officers. And then about 50 Vietnamese students every two weeks. So about 450 pilots were being trained every two weeks, and virtually every one of us went to Vietnam. About the only ones that didn't go to Vietnam if they already had a brother there. So um, there are approximately 4,500 helicopter pilots in our crew, door gunners and so on. If you do the math, that's about every one of every 12 names on the wall is a helicopter crewman. Uh, but look at the lives we saved. Uh, the wall in, in uh, Washington, D.C. would have probably been twice as big uh, if, if it wasn't for the Huey helicopter. So, uh, uh, and also there's about 55 air medics. Uh, when a guy went to uh, be a medic in the Army, they went to Vietnam, they had no idea where they were going to be assigned. They might go to an aviation unit, dust off unit, whatever, a ground unit. Uh, one of the uh, stories that I've been able to document uh, in my books, I put these books together here uh, about our rescue missions. Uh, one of the medics uh, told me that uh, when he got to Vietnam, he had papers in his hand to go to a hospital in Saigon, which would be a rather, rather safe duty. And uh, he says uh, when, when he got to the replacement battalion, they said his orders weren't ready yet, come back tomorrow. Goes back the next day, they're still not ready, so he goes back the third day. He's got his orders, and it's for a unit clear up north, uh, a dust-off unit. And he goes, Sarge, he says, I got these orders for this hospital in Saigon. The sergeant says, son, you can wipe your butt with those papers. That was just to get you over here. Yeah. So the, our, our medics had no idea where they were going. But one nice thing, uh, if, we, uh, if we lost a helicopter, you know, whether we were shot down, maybe we were not exercising good safety, whatever, Sometimes you had no choice. I mean, they, just, they took you out. Uh, maybe uh, as a young warrant officer, 19-year-old, right out of high school, maybe you made a dubious decision and had a problem, an accident, whatever. Anybody want to guess what our punishment was? <laughs> you really, really, really had to screw up to get taken off flight status. <laughs> they, needed, they needed helicopter pilots. Yes, sir? We had we could carry our personal weapons. Uh, we were we were issued yeah sidearm. We were issued a 38 five caliber Smith and Wesson. Some guys had 45s, and then we also had M16s. Well, the M16 was draped over the back of my armored seat, and the 35 35, <laughs> the 38 caliber five shot pistol. It was like John Wayne. You had a holster and you had that weapon, but you didn't tie it to your leg like John did. Okay, because when you sat in that seat, you put it around like this, because there is absolutely no protection in the front of that helicopter. So uh, uh, 
So um, I want to read this excerpt to you. Uh, it's, it's, again, from one of the books. And excuse me just a second. I, I rarely don't get emotional when I read this. <clears throat> this is from a wounded soldier that was picked up at night. I was wounded on my 21st birthday, hit by a rocket propelled grenade that left pieces of me literally all over the battlefield. I fully accepted the fact that my life was going to end that pre-dawn morning. As I was telling my loved ones goodbye, the ground medics told me that I was being medevaced. I told them that they were crazy, the site was too hot. For the rest of my life, I will never forget the whopping sound of the Huey's blades and the sight of that spotlight clearing the tree line. As the helicopter got closer, I could see sparks flying everywhere as countless small arm rounds hit the helicopter. I remember thinking there is no way any of those guys will make it. I honestly thought the helicopter would be shot down and we would all die. But somehow, through all the gunfire, they got in. I remember seeing those beautiful angels pick me up and take me aboard. I remember the pinging of bullets ripping through the skin of the Huey and hearing the crew excitedly yet calmly talking to one another. And I saw this face above me. The face had blood all over it, and it was saying to me, Buddy, stay with me. Hey, buddy, you're going to be all right. Over and over again, I would drift in and out of consciousness. And all I can recall is this bloody face telling me I was going to make it. When I came to, a nurse asked me if I felt like company. Something happened that will live with me the rest of my life. The dust-off crew was in the hospital with me. The guys that saved my life, the young boys that rescued me, themselves had been wounded. The blood on the air medic's face was not mine, it was his. A bullet had gone through his cheek, but rather than attend to his own wounds, he kept me alive. There are no words to tell you how I feel about dust-off. You can hear and read all the stories you want, but nothing replaces having gone through what I did. These young fellows went into the paths of all those bullets to save my life, someone they didn't even know. I cannot think of one reason why a dust-off crew would put their lives on the line time and time again, <clears throat> other than what one of the crew members told me when I asked. That's our job. Okay? And that was, thank you, that, that was what we were trained to do. Uh, and I'll get into it here in a minute, but uh, uh, I would just, by luck of the draw, was assigned to fly dust-off. And I wasn't real happy about it, but as it turned out, I wouldn't trade a second of it. Just to get another idea of what we went through, um, one of the new co-pilots who contributed the story told me that when he first got uh, to our unit, he was in the same unit I was in, but later, he says his new uh, aircraft commander says there's three lights at the end of the runway. Okay? He says if you three, see the three lights, you go. If you don't see the three lights, you go anyway and you pray. <laughs> One of the things that we had on our medevac helicopters was what we called a jungle penetrator. Uh, you can see the hoist, you can see the arm coming out. Uh, that would, uh, was compressed, so to speak, to go down through the trees, and then once it hit the ground, uh, then you could open up seats. And it, it would have three seats, but normally we just would pick up one or two at a time. Hoist mission was absolutely the worst thing that we ever had to do, the most dangerous thing we ever had to do, because you're just sitting above the trees, and even if the enemy can't see you, they're shooting at you. How, why, why, why are we going doing this? Well, there's wounded. Why are there wounded? Because there's bad guys around. Now, notice I said you wait for it to touch the ground. Uh, it builds static electricity as it's going down. And, the, and if the guys on the ground didn't wait for it to touch the ground, they would get the shock of their life. So, so uh, but anyway, the hoist uh, was very, very valuable. Uh, we were able to save a lot of lives that we would not have been able to save otherwise. However, we lost a lot of crews because of hoist missions. And, and again, I've been able to document some of those to honor those that didn't make it back. This picture's off the internet. Uh, just, they're waiting for the hoist. He's, you know, here we are, you know, drop, drop the hoist. Because you can see there's no place for a, for a helicopter to land there. Uh, but that's, uh, again, that's off the internet. I wish I could attribute it to somebody. But uh, that, uh, that, just because of that picture, I know they're waiting for that hoist to come down. Um, this is northern Vietnam. In fact, in the background is the demilitarized zone. Rock pile and Razorback. Do those look familiar to you? 
this gentleman was in that same area. Uh, very, very, very recognizable landmarks. Uh, when you saw those, you knew exactly where you were. But if you look down here very, very closely, you'll see something on that peak. Of course, the military likes the high ground. That's a Marine helicopter. That was a listening post for the Marines, and uh, their living quarters are part way down the mountain. But uh, they had to put a little extension on that pad up there just for the front wheel of the helicopter. That's a it. Book, no, that's a uh, uh, Bur the, the Boeing Vertol uh, oh. CH-46. But yeah, it looks like a Chinook. It's got the yeah. dual engines, dual rotors, but it's, uh, the fuselage is not as wide. It can't carry as much as a Chinook can. But uh, just kind of a neat picture. Uh, again, we like the high ground, but if you look close, you'll see the fuselage of the helicopter didn't quite make it in. Uh, I don't see any landing pad up there, so they might have been trying to hover and dump stuff out when they, when they were shot down. Uh, don't, I'm not familiar with that at all. don't know anything about it. Uh, Hill 950. Uh, if you can see in the background, you can see a straight line in the bottom of the valley. That's Quezon Runway. Uh, that was a, a hill that was overrun, uh, which, uh, the, again, I've been able to document the story. A good friend of mine was the aircraft commander on that mission where, um, where the aircraft was shot down, and they were able to limp to the Quezon Runway where another one of our aircraft who had been following them because they knew it was a, a bad pickup, uh, very, very... Uh, insecure pickup, that they sent two aircraft out. Uh, this uh, listening post was later overrun, but uh, the, um, the story goes that uh, they were able to, to save some lives in a brand new helicopter. Uh, Huey requires a very thorough inspection every 100 hours. The aircraft that they rescued these guys in didn't even make it to the first 100 hour inspection. Remember all those Hueys that were lost? We had two aircraft in our unit. We normally had uh, six aircraft at any one time. We had two of them that never made it to the first 100-hour inspection. We had two more that never made it to the 200-hour inspection. So the average life of a Huey in Vietnam was really only about six months. So I'm going to back up a little bit to flight school. Uh, does anybody recognize this guy here? <laughs> Let me help you. Uh, that's you. <laughs> okay. That young skinny yeah, that young skinny kid. With hair? <laughs> yeah, with hair. That's him. Yeah. Uh, 150 pounds there. I only weighed 135 when I went to basic training. When I got out, I was 150. Now I'm a little more than that. But anyway, yeah. Um, that is a Osage, another Indian name, even though it was a uh, training helicopter, two seats, very, 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 very rudimentary instrumentation, one radio, uh, just it was a basic trainer. Uh, we were kind of hard on them, but they served their purpose. Uh, we called them Mattel Metzer Schmitz. Uh, they were uh, uh, driven by eight Gates V-belts. Um, so this aircraft is still being made today, but uh, it was a pretty good little, little helicopter. Now compare it to a Huey. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now you get an idea why, why our flight school was nine months. Uh, we uh, learned on the little ones, we learned to control the aircraft. Uh, and then uh, eventually our last uh, couple of months of training, we got the Hueys. Um, there's a co-pilot and pilot is the design of the helicopter. But if you notice, the instrument panel is offset to the right. So as aircraft commander, I wanted to sit in the left seat because I had better visibility. But the aircraft is completely flyable by either position, by either pilot, both are fully capable. But uh, you have a lot of instruments on the right side for that uh, instrument flight, that night bad weather flying. Uh, just to give you a little better close up, uh, on the left is the overhead panel, circuit breakers, which is for lights and heater and windshield wipers and defroster, which, yes, we did have. And on the right is a console. Um, if you're familiar with like an Astro van or a, 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 just a regular, like a Savannah conversion van, that's about the size of the interior of a Huey. So you've got your two pilots up front, you've got a console in between you, and then you've got the cargo compartment in the back. Okay, here's another do you know. Note the date. Uh, my call sign was 711. I never said 711. I was not, not one of my, what's the word I want? You know what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, it was always 711, never, never 711. Uh, but you can see uh, the armored seat, um, and there's just one point sticking up. That's the barrel of the M16 that's hanging over the seat. 
Uh, the aircraft is wide enough for three litters. You might call them stretchers. We call them litters, but you can see them stacked three. Uh, and then in the back is a seat for two for the walking wounded. Uh, that's the same on both sides of the aircraft. Our crew sat on the floor. Uh, they picked up some 18-inch pieces of armor from the tank guys, wrapped an army blanket on it, and that's what they sat on up against our armored seat. So that was, that was their protection because you have no protection whatsoever uh, in the back. It's just, uh, you know, weight is very critical on a helicopter. So uh, we didn't, they, they figured we were kind of important up front, so they gave us the armored seats. But again, no protection from the front. Your head's exposed, your arms are exposed, your legs are exposed. And then we would wear what we called a chicken plate. Uh, either it was a complete vest or I had just a plate and it would rest on my lap and my shoulder harness would hold it in place. Um, so the significance is uh, this was my first full day as aircraft commander, which is the epitome of flying uh, for a pilot uh, and flying helicopters in combat. Uh, dust off, we flew single ship missions. We rarely had gun support. We want to get out there. We want to get the wounded and get them back. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, you're making the decision. I was 21 years old at the time because I had a couple years of college. Uh, but we had 19-year-olds. You could go into flight school, Warren Officer Flight School, right out of high school. So you graduate high school at 18 and 19, you're flying helicopters in Vietnam. And if you're in a dust-off unit, uh, you prove yourself worthy. Uh, you're probably still 19 years old. You're an aircraft commander. You're in charge of the aircraft, the mission, the crew, the wounded, everything. That's your, your deal. So it was uh, the, the big feather in your cap was to make aircraft commander. So on November 12th, that was the day after I made aircraft commander. Three days later, there's that same aircraft, the same door. That's a bullet hole. Okay, caught it in the arm. Did some nerve damage and uh, typical military humor. I uh, am a member of an organization in Peru, Indiana. We're the same group that we're building the Huey Museum. This is our latest restoration, a uh, uh, Huey gunship, a B model, which is a very, very, very rare bird. Uh, there's only one other uh, bird anywhere close to it still flying in the United States today. Uh, this one is more accurate. Uh, they had to make some changes to make theirs flyable. Um, but the reason, uh, uh, the reason I point it out is that there are five uh, dust-off pilots in our organization. We have three Hueys that we fly. Um, all five of us dust-off pilots have a Purple Heart. So, like I say, they, they did shoot at us because they knew we were vulnerable. Uh, and speaking of that, anybody have tickets for the Reds games for Fourth of July weekend? Serious. We're going to fly all three Hueys over uh, Friday and Saturday for the National Anthem. And then we'll be giving flights, membership flights, at Sunken Lunkin'. And then Sunday is Veterans Day. We're going to land all three aircraft out in the outfield that you can come and see them up close. And I'll be there. Uh, if you happen to see us fly over before the game, one of our aircraft is a medevac helicopter. And I'll be in the left seat. So uh, uh, my dad used to bring us down. I, I told Alan, I remember we used to come down Route 42 to go to the Reds games when I was a kid. So it's going to be great. To, unfortunately, Crosley Field is no longer around. But... But, uh, but we also do reenactments with our three aircraft. That's the gunship that looks like it's out of control. And then that's our slick. Uh, we call slick a troop carrier. It had a door gun, but it didn't have external armaments like the rockets and mini guns and so on. And this is part of uh, our reenactment that we do at our hangar in Peru, Indiana. You can see a loach up there in the upper right-hand corner. That's privately owned, but he comes for our event uh, in August that we do uh, reenactments with uh, uh, infantry reenactors. Uh, they even have a guard dog. The guard dog goes along and jumps out of the helicopter and stuff. It's pretty cool. Excuse me. Um, the closest that we'll be that we'll be doing a reenactment is uh, probably Fort Jennings, Ohio, which is an old revolutionary fort town, and they're up on the other side of Wapakoneta. So if you'd like to come and see the aircraft, maybe take a flight with us, uh, then I think that's going to be the closest, unless you go down to Lincoln. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the schedule is, but I just happen to have some cards up here. If you're interested, uh, you can go online and get all the details. We're a 501c3 not-for-profit organization. We're all volunteers. And I already told you about that. <coughs> so, um, during World War II, if you were seriously wounded, you only had a 40% chance of surviving. You might spend two or three days before you saw 
anybody other than a medical corpsman. Anybody want to guess what the survivability rate in Vietnam was with our Huey helicopter, our onboard medic, and our crew chief, who also had a lot of OJT first aid from the medic? You want to take a guess? I'll give you five. I, I would guess, we're talking, I mean, it was a high number, uh, mm -hmm. over 50%. Okay, got to go higher. 80. 80, go higher. Oh, wow. 90. Higher. Higher, 98, 98%. 98 now, it might be missing arms and legs, but they survive. Uh, and I'm sorry if I keep referring to the books, but that's my source. Um, one of the stories that I've been able to document was KIA means killed in action. WIA means wounded in action. So our, one of our medevac crews, dust off crews, is going in to pick up a WIA, wounded in action. They're, they're on short final to land, and the radio operator calls dust off. Nope, you know, don't waste your time. Our WIA is a KIA. The medic, our crew, are always listening to all of our radio conversations. They need to know what's going on. The medic says to the pilot, get me in there. Get me in there. So they, of course, went on in and landed, which they would have done anyway. And uh, the medic was able to bring him back around. So that's one that was not breathing when we got to him that survived. But if they were breathing when we got to them with our Huey and our onboard medic, they had a 98% chance of survival. And, and now they call it the golden hour. We just knew go get them and get back as quick as you can. But it was not unusual for us to have the guys uh, on, on the operating room table within an hour or less of when they were wounded. Uh, what was the average distance between pickup and getting back to the base? It just depended. Uh, our area was rather narrow, and, it, and we didn't have too far to go north and south. Um, I can't think of any time when it took me more than a half hour to get, once we p got them picked up. Uh, 10, 15 minutes, not unusual at all. Because, uh, I, I'm sorry, are you a Vietnam veteran? No, sir. Okay. Quang Tri was a smaller outpost. They had an airport there, a military airport. But there was a lot of activity around the DMZ. So we had a standby aircraft at Quang Tri while our base was about 20 minute flight further south. So if we knew uh, as, as, a, as a unit that there was probably going to be more need for, for medevac, we would station uh, one or two aircraft, uh, so, and that would be near an aid station or a hospital, whatever. So uh, the Army was very good about that. They were very good about taking care of their wounded. Very good. Uh, I talked about the 18-year-olds, the 19-year-olds. These were two Southern California surfer dudes. Uh, they were both warrant officers, and uh, they were both 19 years old in this picture. Um, at 19, you could not buy a drink in the States. You could not vote during the Vietnam War. One of the few things our Congress did was to allow 21-year-olds to now vote at 18 because of the Vietnam War. Somebody finally realized if you're old enough to fight for your country, you should at least vote for the people that are sending you there. But in 1969, I guarantee you that is not seven up in those cups. Uh, yeah, but I wanted to real quickly um, uh, relate a mission to them. Uh, the gentleman with the mustache is no longer with us. The other guy uh, lives in Southern California, a very good friend of mine. In fact, both these guys, there were four of us that ran around together. Uh, we're good friends in Vietnam, and that's uh, two of the three. Um, the guy on the left in the yellow shirt uh, was what we called first up, like you see in the movies. Everybody runs to the aircraft and you go. Um, and then second up is a backup aircraft. Uh, if they're not flying a mission to rescue, they might be uh, taking somebody out to the hospital ship for an eye exam or something like that. So they get a call and there are more casualties that can be carried in one, than in one Huey. So what they did was they both go out and as they're on their way out, uh, Chalk 2, the guy with the mustache, calls Chalk 1 and says, hey, uh, who's going in first? And first up says, well, I'm first up, so I'll go in first. So he goes in and he lands while the other guy is orbiting in case he gets in trouble. Well, once they land and start loading their wounded, we know that they've got a lot of wounded to get on, mortar rounds start dropping in. And what they do is they walk them. If somebody's watching and if they're off, then they adjust. And so they're walking them in and chalk two, uh, calling one, hey, they're getting close, they're getting close, get out of there. I'm almost ready. So he finally gets his wounded uh, loaded and he's off. Well, now Chalk 2's got to go in. Now he knows they got him. 
they got it zeroed in. So he calls the guys on the ground, move your wounded to the other end of the landing zone, which I don't know, maybe from here to the building over there. I don't know how far it was. Let me know when you, when you got them ready. So they move their wounded to the other end of the landing. Okay, we're ready. So Chalk 2, guy with the mustache, goes in and he lands at the first spot. Waits about two seconds and then he picks it up to a high hover and goes over. So while, as soon as he touched down, they start lobbing the mortars in. Well, while those mortars are in the air, now he's over here and they don't have time to adjust. He gets these wounded on and they're out. Nobody taught us that stuff. But they figured it out on their own, these 19-year-old kids. And I look at 19-year-olds today and I wonder. Real quick, I want to go over a couple of myths. Two-thirds of the men who served in Vietnam were volunteers. Two-thirds in World War II were drafted. Approximately 70% of those killed in Vietnam were volunteers. 86 of the men were Caucasians, 12 and a half black. The reason I bring that up is because the theory, the myth was that the blacks were being used as cannon fodder. Well, at the time, uh, the population in the country was 13.5% black. So actually, uh, their, their casualty rate was a little less. Um, almost 80% had a high school education or better. Average age in Vietnam, was the myth was 19 years old, it was actually 22. The average man in World War II was 26. And then you can read the last item there. A lot more combat because of the helicopter. Uh, 68 Tet Offensive, if you're familiar with it, how many of you believe that it was a loss for the United States? How many believe it was a victory? It was a victory, but the problem was the bad guys threw everything they had at us. And they, our generals have been telling the press and Congress, hey, we got these guys on the run. They got one foot in a grave and the other on a banana peel. And, and then, like I say, the North Vietnamese, the Viet Cong threw everything they had. That's when they lost Walter Cronkite. When you lose Walter Cronkite in the 60s and 70s, you've lost the war. So we didn't lose the war. We didn't lose it. But we were there because it was a civil war. We were there to help them become a Democrat or, or maintain a Democratic Republic. Can't even talk. Uh, as we are. We're not, a, we're not a democracy. We're a republic. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, okay? So we were there to support them. But what happened? Well, Congress pulled it out in 1973. Vietnam fell in 75. We weren't even there. There were a bunch of Marines at the consulate in, in Saigon, and that was it. So real quick, we're going to fly a mission. Let me wet my whistle. We've got wounded. We're going to go pick them up. We've got a radio call. Normally, we've got the aircraft started within two minutes, uh, three if we're in the mess hall. Grab that paper plate and run to the aircraft, scooping as much in as you can because you don't know when you're going to eat again. And, and, uh, but we get strapped in. We call for artillery clearance, and we're going to get them out. Like I say, we didn't call it the golden hour then. We just knew we were going to get them out. So um, this is typical countryside uh, away from the, to the shore, from the ocean. Uh, you see a lot of white dots, those are bomb craters or uh, uh, rocket runs from a jet aircraft. But I know I've got wounded out here. How am I going to find them? Well, they gave me their coordinates, again, if you remember, in the clear. So I know about where I'm going, but I still don't know exactly where they are. I've got an instrument, any, I, didn't, I already asked if you were a pilot, it's called an instrument landing system. That you, it'll put you down on the threshold of a runway. But you've got a needle that goes up and down and one that goes left and right. And when they're two needles are centered, there's a little donut behind it. Well, when I'm talking to the guys on the ground with my FM radio, this needle will go left or right, tell me whether they're to the left or the right of me. So as they're talking to me, I can turn the aircraft till that needle is centered. So now I know at least where exactly what direction they are. Um, so as I'm talking to them, uh, of course, again, the guys in the back are listening. As I'm talking to them, I want to know information about this pickup. So I'm going to give them a call. Click 66. This is dust off 711 ETA, estimated time of arrival, about zero, 05 minutes. And then he's going to answer me back. Roger, dust off 711. Roger, five mics. We always like to shorten everything. Not minutes, that's two syllables. Mics is one. So again, I'm watching that needle as he's talking to me. And so then, okay, understand you have three urgent wounded. Again, my guys in the back are listening. As soon as we get three on board, we're out of there. If you got another one, you better tell me before we land because we're, we're, we're not sitting on the ground because that's, that's when we die. Dust off, that's affirmative, three urgent. 
Now, next thing I want to know is what direction was your last contact and how long ago? Dust off small weapons fire from the west approximately 15 minutes ago. Okay, I'm going to avoid the west. I'm preferably going to come in from the east. Hopefully the wind's with me. If it's not, we're going to make some adjustments on the way in and find out what that Hewitt can do. I mean, it's an amazing aircraft. Roger contact from the west. I'm zero one out. Pop your smoke. Or when you hear me, pop your smoke. If, if I'm able to establish contact with him farther away. Okay. Now, one thing that I want them to do is just tell me smoke's out. Don't tell me what color you're popping. Because again, the bad guys are listening. And the, one of my last days of flying called for smoke and four smokes came out. Called the guys on the ground. Hey, I got two, two green, a red, and a, and a yellow. Oh, we're the yellow. Okay. Well, so that was where we landed and we avoided the others because we knew that's where the bad guys were. Thank you very much. Uh, but again, that's, that's, that's what you had to do. So uh, I want to know when his smoke is out, but don't tell me the color. I'm going to identify the color. Okay. I've got yellow smoke. And you can see it there on the ridge line. So now I know exactly where they are. And I don't do a flyover. Oh, there's a, okay. I just go right into that smoke. I don't mess around one bit because, again, I know there's bad guys around there. Uh, if Now, normally, uh, on something like this, I might drop down to treetop level and fly up and then plop down. Okay? This picture was taken in Laos during that incursion. There's the yellow smoke. And uh, if you look up here, the medic is taking this picture. Here's my wounded here. Here is the ground guide saying, land here. I know that hopefully this is clear of mines. I've also got some more wounded over here. And if you look, there's a couple guys all around. But when it's done properly, which it was 99% of the time, that when I land to that ground guide, my wounded are right next to my two open cargo doors. Crew chief and my medic get them on board and we're out. And again, as soon as we got three on board, one of the guys in the back is yelling, go, go, go. And we're out. So this one was done just absolutely perfectly the way we, way we needed it done. You can see the guy's probably got his head bandaged there. Um, but there's no place to land, just like that very first picture that I showed you. Uh, they're just going to put some part of the skids on the ground till, till we get them loaded, and then, and then they're out of there. One, one quote that uh, later we found a little ironic. And I'm not just talking to us stuff, because a lot of, lot of guys, the slicks, the, the, the troop carriers, they would pull medevac missions too. The only problem was they didn't have an onboard medic, so... Uh, we wanted to get to them if at all possible, but a lot of times guys were taken back by the slicks. Uh, there are even uh, documented stories of cobras rescuing uh, wounded, which is, I won't give you any details, you've got to read the book. <laughs> but let's just say one pilot was riding on the outside of the aircraft. So, yeah, we, we did what we had to do. Good friend of mine, Ron Huey Huther, I wonder where he got that nickname. Uh, he was 1st Cavalry Division, and uh, that's how he signs off his emails. Give back all the medals. I'll let you read that. I know you can read. Here's my, here's my theory. Hate the war, but you got to love the warrior. But that didn't happen 50 years ago. We, we were blamed. We were blamed. Anybody know who said that? Got a highway named after him. Yep. So, any, any younger guys want to be a pilot? Okay. Well, if you ever do, here's three things you need to remember. That was a great landing, sir. <laughs> Second most important thing, I'll buy the first round, sir. The third most important thing is, Sorry, sorry. It's not my joke. It's not my joke. But it, yeah. Yeah. I know the ladies do the same thing. Now, don't, don't get me wrong here. Yeah. You, you take the ugly one, Helen. So, I'm going to wind this down with a couple of things for you here. I've got a picture puzzle for you. And I, I talked to you about the warrant officers and the, the real live officers, the RLOs, the lieutenants and captains, and so on. Um, in fact, we even had a fictitious organization called WOPA, Warrant Officer Protection Association. You know, if you 
got dressed down uh, for some reason by a real live officer. It was, Sir Wope is not going to take kindly to this, you know, but they knew, they knew. But anyway, uh, again, uh, you can go into Warren Officer Flight School right out of high school. You're 18, you're full of urine and vinegar, and, and uh, John Wayne did live. And you've, you're going to give me a helicopter, and, and I'm going to fly the helicopter. I mean, it's like giving a kid a new Corvette. And uh, kids with new Corvettes maybe not always obey the law or, you know, the speed limit, whatever. So anyway, uh, I found this picture on the internet, and uh, I, I knew right away, knew right away what it was. So here's here's your challenge. I want you to find the kid in this picture that went on to become a warrant officer helicopter pilot. Oh. <laughs> I take it some of you figured it oh, out. <laughs> no, no, you don't know who he is, but if he's the only kid in that class that, that you can't, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a free book for anyone who can tell me what unit I served in. And it was up there twice. No, nope. no, nope. nope. I'll give you a hint. Just give me the number. That was my call sign. That was my call sign. Come on, guys. I got a book to give you. <laughs> what? What? You got it. Two thirty-seven. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, and that. Yeah, 237th, yeah, 237th Medical Detachment, yep, yep, yeah, bingo. So, um, that's the end of my formal presentation. Please, questions. Uh, again, nothing inappropriate or taboo. Question and uh, something. Did the jungle penetrators ever get hung up in the trees? Yes. Yes. Did you have to lower them or figure some way to get away from branches? Excellent question. The jungle penetrator, that yellow thing that goes down through the tree, occasionally it would get hung up. Uh, sometimes the aircraft might be taking so much fire that they got to get out of there, that they've got warning lights going off saying, hey, you're going to crash. Uh, the pilots had a red button on the control that we could punch that button. It would fire a 45 caliber round and cut the cable. That was the absolute last thing that we would want to do. Uh, if it got hung up in the trees, sometimes you had no choice. I never had to do it, uh, but I know occasionally it did. So, uh, uh, but yeah, to answer your question, it could get hung up in the trees and you could. Major, would I make one other observation? Mm -hmm. so you're flying the mission and you hit the coordinates of where the people were. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. You, got to, you must have known we only think this is where we are. It was just a best guess. I was in Tain Inn. You mean, it was as flat as could be, dense jungle, no, right. no, no, no terrain features. Well, what, what, was, what was the neatest sound that you heard in Vietnam? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Those rotor blades of that Huey coming. And if I'm flying towards you, you know I'm coming. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, regardless what Huey I am, I'm, I'm a Huey that's coming for you. So you're not going to let me fly past you. Hey, no stuff. I got you. I got your, I, you know, I see you, you know. So, you know, okay, pop your smoke. Yeah. Yeah, no, 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 you guys, you weren't going to let us fly past you. No, no. <laughs> no, and they knew that we didn't stick around. We did, we're coming right in, and we're going right out. Yeah. Yes, sir. I understand it, and you understand it, but none of these people understand what the canopy is. Okay. Of, of, of going through that density. It's yeah. Like, you can explain that a little bit. Sure. We, we, the worst was what we call triple canopy jungle where you had three levels of trees. You had the brush on the ground like we've got our um, uh, honeysuckle here. You had the tall trees and you had medium-sized trees. Oftentimes, we could not see the guys on the ground on a hoist mission. They would tell us when we were directly overhead. And so, so our medic would normally run the jungle penetrator, the hoist. And, uh, and so he would just, on faith, would drop it down because, again, they're listening. Uh, we had a position on our uh, intercom box called Hot Mike. And uh, you don't have to push a button to talk. Normally, you push a button to talk because all four of us then are listening to each other. And we're normally pretty quiet up front when this is going on. And we're listening to the guys on the, in the back because we're settled down in the trees as far as we can. 
and to the point where I want a tree on the nose, touching the nose of my helicopter. So once the guys in the back position me, I'm going to stay there with those, with those limbs on the nose of my aircraft. That's the good news. The bad news is if that tail rotor hits anything, we're going to crash. I mean, probably I'll crash and die. So number one, they're going to keep me clear of any obstacles with that tail rotor, but I'm going to settle down to where I'm up against a tree so I can hold that hover. We may be 10 feet off the ground. We might be 250 feet off the ground. There, that's, that was the maximum length of the, of the cable. But, uh, but the, uh, the triple canopy, again, like I say, the, the enemy may not be able to see us, but they sure can hear us, and they're going to be shooting at us. You're standing in that triple canopy underneath in the middle of the day. It's Dark. Nighttime, Dark. Well, I don't see anybody under 18. When I was talking about how dark it was back in the mountains and stuff, we called it darker than a sack full of ass. <laughs> That's dark. Okay. Please, more questions. Yeah, like you never heard that before. Yes, sir. I've always heard about mass bumping. About what? Mass bumping. Oh, mass bumping? Yeah. yeah. I don't know that, but we were losing some Well, if you can imagine, the rotor blades are like a Frisbee on a stick. And of course, it's more complicated than that. But you can do some rather evasive move, maneuvers to where that rotor, those rotor blades are banging up against the mast. And you can literally have that rotor system separate from the aircraft. Uh, so it's something that you learn in flight school not to do. Uh, and uh, it normally was not a problem. But I'll tell you what you could do. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, I want the wind, I want to land in the wind if at all possible. But if that takes me over the bad guys, okay, let's say here's my wounded, I'm gonna come in and, and the wind is, I wanna, I wanna land like this, but I got bad guys. So if I land like that, I'm gonna fly over them. So what I do is I come in fast over the trees, I literally lay it up on its side, use that rotor system for a break and drop down. Now my tail is to the bad guys, get my wounded loaded, I'm taking off into the wind. So, so even though a helicopter can land downwind, an airplane can land downwind, you don't want to because it's dangerous. You want to do in the wind whenever you can. Now, yeah, we did dangerous things, but that was what we did to survive, and that's how we took care of our wounded. Yeah. So does that answer your question? Yeah. But that, you won't get into mass bumping if, you, if, you, if you're not all over the place with the controls. If you just do it smooth, just pull the nose up and let it drift around. Kick some pedal in so that tail comes around, and you just drop right down in. The, and when you're doing this, I'm not exaggerating, the blades would be about the height of the ceiling over the ground as you're coming around because the lower you are, the less likely you are to be shot. So you're doing that stuff just literally feet away from the ground. But again, that's what you had to do to survive, but we got to be very good at it. Some days you might fly six, eight, 10 hours, make 20, 30, 40, Takeoffs and landings, easy. And so, yeah, you get to be pretty good at it. Yeah. Any rescues did you make? Yeah, I did. I very religiously kept a diary. And uh, every night I filled in the diary. And I flew for four and a half months. And uh, I had picked up 379 wounded, plus the three guys the night I was wounded, because I hadn't written in my, life, in my diary yet. Um, I, I'm sorry, I take that back, I did. But anyway, uh, we averaged about 100 hours a month, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little, little less. I'm sorry, were you the one that asked the question? Oh, you did. I'm sorry, because I'm looking at him. Um, the Army said that we could only fly 110 hours a month. But I got, I got wounded out there that need my aircraft, my skill, my training. So if we got to 110 hours, we just quit logging the hours. We, we kept flying, we just quit logging the hours. So. No? Well, that was just it. Uh, you want to go to the PX down in Da Nang? Uh, sir, we're going to go down to the PX. Okay, give us a call if you need anything, or you know, we'll call you if we need anything. So you, yeah, yeah, you, you just call the tower. Hey, dust off 711, you know, south departure. Okay, you're clear. No flight plans, no weather checks, no nothing. But again, we were dispensable. We were dispensable. Just guys, fly the mission, and everybody will be happy. And that's what we did. No, no, I was not. I was there, and uh, it, it sort of toward the end of the ceremony, they had a helicopter fly up from down on the, mm. the roadway down below, come up over the trees, and scared oh, the yeah. heck out of everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yep, and that's how we got away with a lot of things, 
because a, a helicopter puts out a cone of sound. So the higher up you are, the farther away you're going to hear us. But if I'm down on the deck, treetop level literally at 120 knots, which is maximum speed of a Huey, you're not going to hear me until I'm right on top of you. By the time you grab your weapon and point it up, I'm gone. So that's about 135 miles an hour. So again, pop your smoke. I'm going to come in low and hot, and I'm going to, I'm just, you know, I'm going to make those split-second decisions when I see, when I pop, when I clear the streets. So, and and again, the guys were very good about it. You know, they might say, "Hey, I got stumps in the LZ. We blew some trees down, so you could get in here." So you might have three, four, five-foot high stumps. So you don't want to land to the ground. You want to land to a hover, and let your crew pull the wounded up into the aircraft. So yeah, very rarely did did we get misinformed by the guys on the ground. Yeah, very very, very well coordinated. The crews, oh my goodness, they were generally a year younger than us, 18, 19, 20 years old. We were 19, 20, 21 years old. Um, every one of them, just super job, super job. And and the nice thing about it was that any one of us could have quit flying at any time. Only had one one pilot quit. Uh, he <laughs> he was my co-pilot the night I was wounded. And then uh, later, uh, he was aircraft commander, and he caused an accident where everybody was killed except for him. And he says, I'm done. And I said, no problem, no problem. You're, you're now the officer's club manager. You know, serve out your time. You know? uh, and, and volunteers, guys, guys like this gentleman here, volunteering to be a door gunner on a helicopter. How stupid is that? It's $50 more a month. Yeah, you're right, you're right. <laughs> $50 jump pay. You, you, you made about 250 to $300 a month in Vietnam, correct? Yeah, yeah. I was making 750 but I had free, you know, free yeah, dental and free, DVD free meds. And college degree. No, I didn't. Oh, you didn't? No, that was the nice thing about the Army oh. Warrant Officer Program. You could go in right out of high school. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah, you're right. $50 more flight pay for hanging yeah. your butt out hanging in the air. Here. Yeah, no logs to hide under. Your big old uh, steel pot is set on and my yeah. uh, so-called flat jacket. Yeah, you know? but uh, this gentleman was infantry. Were you infantry first and then volunteered for door gunner? Infantry, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mama, ta you, Mama but... taught you better than that. I know she did. <laughs> yeah, but it was exciting, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, it was, was exciting. For. Yeah. That's what I was looking for. Make the time go faster. Just real quick, I had at one time had to call in a dust off. Mm -hmm. Uh, years ago, back in the 60s, us, us older people will probably remember Harry S. Rosedale School for Talent. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, his son, John Jr., was in my uh, uh, infantry outfit. And uh, John was a reporter. Uh, John Jr. was a reporter. He uh, was a brigade historian. And he would go out on flights or whatever, and you know, and, and document the uh, the events. He was with us one day. It was sometime in July of 1967. We were we made contact with the enemy. John got wounded pretty bad, and uh, I was uh, at the sergeant at that time, uh, squad leader. And I had what they call a grease map. You, some of you guys probably know what a grease map is, where you write your coordinates, yeah. where you know where you're at. Right, yeah. You know? Yeah. And, with uh, a grease map. Yeah, yeah, with a grease map. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, you write it on your map. Yeah. yeah. And so I knew where I was at. But uh, they came in, and uh, we started get, receiving fire as they, as the dust off came in. And this, this pilot, I wish, you know, I don't remember who it was, obviously. No, you wouldn't. But this this guy was doing this, and he come in and he set that bird down. And like you said, he wasn't there. I bet he wasn't there thirty seconds. He'd have been so, dead by thirty seconds. Threw him on but, air, yeah, but it was quick. Air, it was and, quick. Uh, flew him down to Saig or yeah, Saigon. Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll tell you a, a real quick story, and and I know we're the timing. Uh, and if somebody needs to leave, please go ahead. Um, one, uh, one mission, I'm sitting in the right seat, I'm still a co-pilot, and uh, the crew chief uh, sat behind the aircraft commander, the medic sat behind me. We had this one guy, Tex, you can imagine his size. He had, <laughs> he had made any football team proud. He was the medic, and uh, we went in to pick up some South Vietnamese soldiers who were generally smaller, 
And uh, it was a hot landing zone. And so the aircraft commander tells the guys in the back, okay, there's a hot LZ, let's get them on and get out. So they took him to heart, especially Tex. So just as we touch down, I'm, I'm looking forward as I normally do, because I want to be ready if, when we need to take off, I catch some movement out over here. And I look, and there's the crew chief over there. He's helping the South Vietnamese soldier back on the aircraft. Tex is grabbing him and throwing him like this. And the first guy went all the way through. I mean, just like in the cartoons. And so the, the crew chief's pretty smart. He goes like this with his hand to stop the second guy coming through, and he's helping the first one back on. I, yeah, uh, both those guys are still with us, and, and when we get together, I always tell them, you know, that's one of my favorite stories. But again, you, you did what you had to do. We uh, were very proud of what we did. Uh, like I say, anybody could have quit at any time. We knew it was dangerous. Uh, when I w first went into flight school, I wanted to be a gunship pilot. Flying unarmed medevac helicopters, that's stupid. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in with my guns blazing and at least defend myself. Yeah. And then I got orders for dust off. And so uh, that was like with two weeks to go in, in flight school. And I told my roommate uh, in the barracks, I said, that's it, I'm not coming home. Uh, but uh, as it turned out, like I said, I would not have traded a second of it. Uh, very, very rewarding. Uh, like I say, very risky. But uh, gosh, the adrenaline and the rush and, and uh, everything. Uh, you know, I, I know how EMTs and firemen are now when they go on a run and, and, yeah. and go into the burning building. Uh, it, was, uh, it was pretty amazing. But again, like I say, it's like giving a kid a new Corvette and, and giving them a mission. Wow. How cool yeah. is that? How cool is that? Looking for the adventure. Yeah. For real. Yeah. I yeah. the time commander referred to you guys as juvenile delinquents with helicopters. That's right. <laughs> and damn proud of it. Yeah, yeah. Damn proud of it. Yep. Yeah. Also, I... I Friends that were pilots. They called us and, those crazy helicopter guys, too. Well, yeah. They said, we can teach anybody to fly a, a helicopter. They're looking for an attitude. So screw <laughs> it, I'm going in. Yeah. 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 And, and again, let me, real quick, and then I'll get to your question, sir. Um, each book has at least 20 missions. I asked $20 each. And every mission in there is true. Uh, each book has at least 20. Uh, I only brought uh, a few copies, but uh, uh, I've done 11 books now, and I'm working on the 12th. And just absolutely so incredible. Like you say, just, hey, I got a mission to do. You, you do it. Yeah. You do it. And unfortunately, some guys paid the price. Like I say, one out of 12 names on the wall. But uh, if you'd be interested, I'd be glad to sign it, dedicate it. And, uh, uh, I mean, seriously, I don't need the gas money. But oh, yeah. <laughs> Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Uh, Rotor blades with bullet holes in them will whistle. Um, no, actually, I only had one hit before that one on my door. So, so I was lucky, but they, they were lucky. Uh, we almost crashed. We were a team, weren't we? We were a team. Mm -hmm. He found the bullet, he put a hole in it, put it on a chain, we gave it to him, and he said, this is the one with your name on it. Now you only have to watch out for the one that says the woman makes a sense. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. And, and I, I have pieces of the bullet that found me. Uh, luckily, it, it hit my armored seat first, but then I got it, and it shattered into many pieces, and then I got it in the arm, and there was nerve damage, so that was enough to send me home. They call it the, the, the million dollar wound, but I call it the two million dollar wound because of all the guys that are suffering from Agent Orange. Uh, me only being there for four and a half months so far, so good. That's so, a big issue. Yeah. I, I have now with, I suffer from Agent Orange from yep. the VA. Yeah. You know, so far so good. I'm on the registry, but yeah. yeah. Any more questions, please?